Good afternoon. I'm Primary Kennedy, and welcome to the uh, Alma and Joseph Gildenhorn book series. A special thank you. Where are you, Alma? Right here. Thank you. <laughs> A special thank you because it was Alma that actually brought the book and the author to us. And having read it, I am absolutely convinced you're going to have a very riveting conversation today. So um, if you would, just turn off all your electronics so we don't interrupt our broadcast. And um, I get to introduce my friend, Les Crystal. Les came to the news hour in 1983 as the executive producer. And after 22 years, he was named president of McNeil Air Productions in 2005. And um, in 2010, he retired and became special advisor to the News Hour, and we are delighted to have him here as our moderator. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, making it through the inclement weather. I came in from uh, New York this morning. It was uh, quite easy on the train, but I understand a couple of nights ago it was uh, it was tough going around here. Uh, heard stories of people. Uh, requiring five, six, seven hours to get home. Uh, so uh, very nice to meet you and have you here today. Uh, I've been as eager to meet Eric Hazeltine as all of you have. Uh, and uh, he's had an amazing career. Uh, former director of research at NASA, at the NSA rather, former associate director for science and technology at the office director of national intelligence. Executive Vice President of Walt Disney Imagineering and Director of Engineering at Hughes Aircraft. I'm not going to deal his accomplishments. I think you have something that's uh, been handed out that you can read about it. But I want to list his academic background because it's very germane to what we're going to be talking about today, which is some of what we're going to talk about today or at the <coughs> core of what we're going to talk about, he is, is the brain how it works, and how we can innovate using our brain to achieve breakthroughs. Eric is a neuroscientist who has earned his BA in economics and psychology at UC Berkeley, PhD in physiological psychology from the Anderson School of Management at UCLA, and until I read about you, I didn't know there was a category like that. And he did postdoctoral work on the brain in brain research at Vanderbilt School of Medicine. So I thought it would be good to start by having you do a definition for us. Tell us what you mean by the Big Bang and what do you mean by the long fuse? Well, a Big Bang is a difference in kind, not degree. So for example, in the media business that I came from, if you take a book and you put it on a Kindle, you've still got a book but you've changed its nature by degree. It's electronic instead of print. Social media is a completely new animal. And so that's an example of a discontinuity. And big bangs, by their definition, are discontinuities. They're something radically different that completely changes the ballgame. Facebook is a big bang. Right. iPhone is a big bang. Right. But uh, not something necessarily natural of what you'd expect. In fact, what makes it big is you don't expect it. Mm -hmm. You know, in the Black Swan, uh, Nassim Taleb talks about these events that can't be predicted. And he said that if they could be predicted, they wouldn't be big events. Therefore, by definition, no big event is predictable, right. which is a little bit circular, but nonetheless, it's true. Right. <laughs> Except maybe for the person who has the idea for it, who hopes for it, if not expects it. That's right. So, and the long fuse? A long fuse isn't so much a length of time as it is a condition. A long fuse can be anywhere from a year, and I'll explain why I picked that number, to hundreds of years. And really the condition is, a long fuse is how long it takes to do something important instead of how long it takes to do something urgent. Because the main theme of my book is the tyranny of the urgent trumps the pursuit of the important. In other words, we all spend our time throwing ourselves on hand grenades instead of figuring out how to keep the pin in the hand grenade in the first place. So uh, the way I say a year is most of us in the business world get our bonus and our performance appraisal at the end of a year. So what we do in that year is that which will get us a good bonus that year. So anybody who focuses on something that will get you a reward after your reward period 
is doing a long fuse. So it has to do with the psychology of human reward and punishment. So anything, uh, long fuses, Joe and Lai was once asked, what do you think of the French Revolution? And he says, too early to tell. <laughs> so for him, that long fuse hasn't burned out yet. Right. Uh, so to achieve the Big Bang and to light the long fuse, you say we have to overcome some natural tendencies in our brain. Uh, what is it about our brain or brains that we need to address? You know, one of the things that we don't realize because we're in the middle of a very unique period in human evolution is that we are in the middle of a very unique period in human evolution. Think about this. Homo sapiens became Homo sapiens in the Rift Valley of East Africa, as far as we can tell, around 200,000 years ago. And basically, that's what we still are today. Because evolution, however fast it is, is not as fast as technology. So if you think about progress on this axis and time on this axis, humans have been going along like this, pretty much flat. Then all of a sudden, we hit the Renaissance, and poof, we're going like this. Right? So we are changing so fast that our brains can't keep up. So here's an example. How many of you have ever been in a meeting where your boss comes in and says, times are hard, we're going to have to cut budget? More than, more than I'd like to say. Right. So what happens? What you say is, well, I understand that everyone has to contribute, and intellectually this makes sense to me, and I'm fine with it. Or do you go, holy shit, I'm going to lose my budget. Uh, well, you know what the answer is. And the reason is that it's a threat. Now, what's happening, the reason you have that reaction is that you're conditioned that a threat is life-threatening. Because when your brain finished evolving 200,000 years ago, a threat usually was life-threatening. And so we kind of calibrate all threats to that. So we mobilize our autonomic nervous system that tells our gut to stop having blood and stop digesting and gets our muscles all energized and gets our heart racing and our blood pressure up. Right. And that drives a sense of urgency. So that's what creates what neuroeconomists call temporal myopia, which is myopia in time. That we only see things that are right in front of us because that's what's urgent. And that's why I say the tyranny of the urgent trumps the pursuit of the important. So that is the uh, main thing about our brain. There are many more that I talk about in the book, but that's the one big one that makes it very difficult to pursue things that aren't just right in front of your nose. Because we want to deal with short-term problems, right. short-term issues. Right. Like if I said to you in this audience, how many of you have a senior job in which you're supposed to be doing important things and when your underlings are supposed to be doing urgent things? Like you've got the responsibility for strategic direction of an enterprise, right? You're supposed to think big. Do you get to do that? No. Why? Because you're playing whack-a-mole. You know, you know, this customer is unhappy. This production is late. This procurement is screwed up. You know, the market just crashed. You're playing whack-a-mole. You're fighting fires. You're throwing out hand grenades. And uh, I make a good living right now thinking long for CIA CEOs who don't think they have time to. So they hire me and I say, well, here's what your future holds. This is what you can tell your shareholders and make it sound like you have vision. <laughs> Just write me a big check. So, hey, it's a, it's a nice oh. living. Right. <laughs> Thank God for yes, this. Yes, that's Myopia. right. Doing very well. So you say we have really two basic parts to our brain a short-term part and a long-term part. Is that correct or not? Well, I would say we don't really have a long-term part at all. Uh, women will appreciate this. Really what drives our behavior is what's called our limbic system. It's a deep primitive brain. Uh, some call it the lizard brain. Uh, you women will know it as the male brain. Uh, you know, instant gratification. I'm a little boy. I have my toys, you know. Uh, I really think that in one form or another, even the longer-term visionaries I've ever known have been extraordinarily impatient people. What makes greatness is dissatisfaction with the current system. I see all greatness comes from, I don't like the way things are, and I really don't like them, and I'm really motivated right now to change them. And I have found that the really great visionaries figure out a way to translate the vision they see into the present the rest of us sees. And that if they don't do that, their vision just remains a hallucination. So what was the epiphany? How did you come upon this theory? 
Well, I'm about the most impatient person you're ever going to want to meet. But it's really out of necessity because for most of my career, I've been in the R&D business, running R&D labs. That's what I did at Disney. That's what I did at NSA. And then I was like the top geek for the whole intelligence community. And what I found is that when you're an R&D guy and your bosses have either stockholders next quarter to keep happy or General Petraeus to keep happy, who, by the way, is less interested in a year from now than a day from now, right? Um, you, you are struggling constantly for your survival and relevance. Why should we invest in tomorrow? We're just wasting money. And what's the first thing that gets cut? Why was it necessary for the president in the recent State of the Union speech to reinvigorate the quest for uh, investment in R&D? Because when you're in trouble, you eat your seed corn. And that's what we've been doing as a nation. And so really, it was an epiphany that came about by trying to try a zillion different ways to keep my budget alive and not get fired by saying, we are relevant. And so what I learned, particularly at Disney, was if I didn't come up with a way of making my masters, Mike Leisner and the others, see immediate benefit from this long-term R&D, we were going to go out of business. So that, I had to get back to the basics. You know, why is it that they're so short-term focused? Because if you don't get to the root cause of the disease, all you're going to do is put a Band-Aid on when you really got to do surgery. And the surgery that I saw is you got to get to the deep psychological reason why people don't focus on the long-term. And the reason is they never will. So you always have to make the long-term relevant in the short-term. So when you've got some rules of the road, for the brain's playbook. <laughs> right, playbook. The brain's to, playbook. To, uh, to co-opt our brain. Right. And uh, I'm going to go through some of these uh, uh, items in the playbook, and we can talk about some examples that illustrate them. And obviously, we've been talking about um, short term. You say, if you've got this big project, this big idea, you've got to do it in chewable chunks. Right. And I'll give you a recent example that's not in the book. Um, since I want all of you to read the book. There are even better examples in the book. But I got, uh, recently, I've been consulting for a major metropolitan opera. And they have this problem that they're paying a lot of money to ship video of simulcasts of the opera all over the world. And they said, can you figure out a way to do it cheaper? And I looked at a way to do it, and I came up with it, which is right on the bleeding edge. And it basically has to do with using peer-to-peer -peer networking on the internet to break the video up, send it into a zillion pieces, and send it out for free over a bunch of different mesh networks, and then how about come back? There's no question in my mind that that's going to be the future of low-cost, high-definition video. But it's not quite there today. So I said, that's where you want to go. It's going to take you a while to get there. But why don't you do this? Instead of broadcasting to big theaters in Europe and Japan, broadcast to classrooms in the US using this lower-cost, cheap thing that's really free, and get started with that. So you have a long-term vision. The future is peer-to-peer, -peer, free. Can't do it all today, so do it in a completely different market. Take that first baby step that will pay off for you right now today. So there's an example of how you translate your vision of tomorrow into something that pays off for somebody today. Why is it so important for the payoff today? Because people will never pursue anything that doesn't give them an immediate payoff of some kind. This thing I want to come back to about the visionaries that I've known being impatient people, the people who would seem to be the most mature, the most able to suppress instant gratification, turns out they are not. They're the opposite. They are extremely impatient. But what they figure out a way to do is get a payoff today. And I talk about my brother. Some of you may know Bill Hazeltine. And he basically is famous for having figured out how AIDS works. And so all these drugs that you see today really grow out of the discoveries from his lab at Harvard. And that took him 10 years, and he knew it was going to take him 10 years. So in the book, I talk about how he kept himself motivated. And he can be a pretty impatient guy, which isn't a flaw. It's really a virtue in the sense right. that he wants to see results. So what he did was he convinced himself and the rest of his lab that they were up against a sophisticated killer on the level of beyond Moriarty. And it turned out that that is what AIDS is. AIDS is the most incredibly clever, diabolical, killer that has ever been on this planet. And I won't go into all the reasons for that, but the biology is so unbelievably sophisticated and nuanced. And so he said to his team, this is the case 
So every day, we want to get a new clue. We just want one tiny little new clue. And what he'd do is he'd bring in champagne every day. And someone would find that clue and they'd pop the champagne. So he translated his vision, we're going to cure AIDS, into here and now champagne every day. Right? And you call that catering to instant gratification. <laughs> or alcoholism. <laughs> <laughs> but as a concomitant of that, uh, you talked about uh, doing uh, easy, least risky steps. Uh, how'd, right. you, how'd you phrase it? Don't try a brute force assault. How to, how to eat an elephant. Well, I talk about the example of Dr. XX, who I named because of her two X chromosomes. And here's the bottom line, I'll get to it right away. If you want to sell a big idea in Washington, make it look as small as the mind that has to approve it. <laughs> <laughs> right? You, uh, hit a, you hit a good nerve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, by the way, none of you are small minds. <laughs> you, you keep bumping, they say, you know, uh, Newton said, if I see farther, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And what I say is, I don't see very far because I have pygmies standing on my shoulder. <laughs> um, but um, what, what, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, how, don't use brute assault. How oh, right, right, right. So doc, what Dr. XX did was she came to Washington and worked at NIH. She came from an Ivy League medical school. And she was a gynecologist. And she found that at NIH, National Institutes of Health, which has close to 10,000 doctors, they had three gynecologists, including her, and 30 veterinarians. So the nation cared more about animals' health than women's health. And as a woman, she was slightly irritated by this. And so she said, I have a vision. I'm going to put women's health in this country on the same part as men's health. But she saw Excuse what was me, happening. And she was thinking of that In 1985. Range. Right. But she was smart enough to know you can't eat the elephant whole. You have to make a big idea look as small, blah, 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 blah. And so what she did is she said, I'm going to do something. She studied Washington, and she found out that since Carter, no president has won without carrying the women's vote, and that people in office know this. So um, she took this little statistic that was a good sound bite, 30 veterinarians, three gynecologists, and she said, we need more gynecologists. Easy sell in Washington where women determine who the next president is. That was the chewable chunk. But what she also knew is that that would bootstrap her because she'd now have 30 allies. she got 30 gynecologists at NIH. And what are they? They're inside the Beltway. They're a lobbying force. They're a critical mass. And so it all started from that. The Society for Women's Health Research started from that, that whole evolution. And today, women's health isn't anywhere close to men's health, but it's a lot closer than it was in 1985. Did she know she was doing that when she started out with the small Totally. Steps. Totally. That's, uh, that's terrific. Um, you also talk about how do we overcome our blind spots. Uh, we, you know, we're even blind to the existence of blind spots. Right. Uh, what do we do to get those obstacles out of the way? The things you that buy my book and read it, and you recommend it to all your friends. Uh, what you do is this. Um, did you know that where your optic nerve goes punches through your retina. You have a blind spot about the size of a quarter held at arm's length, maybe a little bit bigger. You ever done that experiment in psychology class where you close one eye and you look at an X and an O and you bring the thing in and all of a sudden the O disappears? You ever done that? Well, what that is is that you have this complete hole in your vision about this big and this big. But are you looking at me? Do you see those holes right now? No, because your brain thinks you can't handle the truth. It thinks that you're blind, and it doesn't want you to know you're blind because you'd be upset. So it hides it, so it fills it in. So we have these emotional blind spots, of which there are four, and I talk about in the book. And the point of this, before I get into it, is opportunity and threat hides in those blind spots right in front of you. Have any of you ever seen that video of the gorilla dribbling the basketball? Okay, this is fabulous video on the internet at the University of Illinois, where your task is to look at these college students as they're passing a basketball back and forth. And you're supposed to count how many times the ball has passed. And then they replay this video for you, and you look at it, and shock of shock, there's a gorilla walking in and around. Very obvious. And almost no one sees the gorilla. Right. How can I, that be? I, I saw it. There, there's a question. They tell you to watch it. Then they say, now, how many times did the gorilla pass the ball? And, and you, you just don't have any knowledge that the gorilla was there in the first place. Yeah, Excuse even though me. it's in plain sight. Well, opportunity and threats are like the gorilla. And here are the four blind spots. Your brain doesn't see what it doesn't expect to see. 
In the case of the gorilla, you didn't expect to see a gorilla in a basketball game, right? Um, and also, uh, you see what you do expect to see even when it's not there. Um, the second thing is you don't see what you don't want to see, and you see what you want to see. So for example, how many of you have ever been in love? Come on, I know this is Washington, but... <laughs> okay, you've been in love. Now, when you're in love, you have a certain view of your desired other that morphs a little bit five years later when you wake up and look at their back or listen to them to their snore or, you know, they've got zits or whatever it is. They're messy. And you say to yourself, you know, looking back on it, all the clues were there. You know, I was dating him and he kind of was a slob or he didn't listen to me or he likes sports or, you know, he texts me instead of calls me on the phone or whatever it was. Uh, you know, I kind of knew that. Why didn't that register with me? Well, you don't want to see it. When you're in love, you don't want to see the flaws. And, you know, nature wants it that way because none of us would be here if our parents actually saw each other for who they really were <laughs> when they were dating. So that, the third flaw is temporal myopia. We only see what's right in front of us, so that which is uh, over the horizon we don't see. And then the fourth one is this one of attention. And I use the example, and you pardon me for being so crude, but I want you all to think about your butts right now. Now, you weren't doing that before I brought it up. Okay, so your butt is pressing into your chair, or your chair, according to Einstein, is pressing into your butt. It's, you know, one or the other. But nonetheless, there's pressure on your butt. Now, you were aware at some very peripheral level of that pressure, but you tuned it out, right? Now you're tuning into it, right? So what happens is your brain has a soda straw of attention that it aims at certain things, and it tunes in, and by tuning in, it must tune out. An example of this is what we call the cocktail party phenomena, where you're in a cocktail party, and say Willie there is talking, and I want to listen to her voice, and I know her voice, I can tune into it. And then I can tune into your voice, and then I can tune into your voice. But when I tune in, I tune out. We do this psychologically and without even knowing it. So it creates a blind spot. If we're not focused on it, we don't see it. So you're in a helicopter in uniform. And you're <laughs> flying, I believe it was Iraq. Maybe yeah, I was going down to Hala, which is the uh, right. site of ancient Babylon. And uh, you see a flash from a window. A Halloween light. A Halloween light, yeah. right. And yeah. tell us about the blind spot. Well, this is the uh, blind spot of expectation. So I'm uh, flying. We're going really low to prevent the guys from shooting at us. And because, uh, you know, you come over the horizon fast and leave fast. They have a harder time getting a beat on you. And so uh, I'm flying down to Hala, and I'm looking out the window because we flew with the windows open so we could shoot out. And I'm looking out there, and I see this little hut with a winking orange light. And I thought, what the hell is a Halloween light doing in Iraq in February? And I think I couldn't figure that out. And then I thought, that's not a Halloween light. That's a muzzle flash. They're shooting at us. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I, I got on the intercom and told the pilot, you know, that I think contact right, you know, which is what we were trained to say. And he goes, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, they take pot shots all the time. They don't usually hit us. And, uh, but the point was that I didn't expect to be shot at. I had never seen, I shot a weapon a lot. But I'd never seen a weapon being shot at me. You don't usually get that on the range. Uh, and so <laughs> the first time I saw a weapon being shot at me, I went, it was like Yosarian in Catch-22. You know, they're trying to kill me. <laughs> and uh, it was because I didn't uh, expect it. Your brain wants to always normalize. It wants to take the unexpected and make it expected. And that's what you actually perceive. And so the, the relevance of that story is that you just don't see things for what they really are could be a threat, like someone shooting at you, or an opportunity. See, well, that, that, that could have been an opportunity, and we could have taken the helicopter, landed behind the guy, captured him, interrogated him, and got some intelligence. Mm -hmm. So it's a threat, and it's an opportunity. But you also mentioned, and I, and I think it applies to Afghanistan too, an additional opportunity, in, or in terms of how do you solve the problem? Do you shoot him? Do you fly or her? Do you fly behind and capture? Or is there another way to deal with that person well, shooting at you? Yeah, in the book what I talk about is, as Americans, we are incredibly naive culturally. And we do what we call mirroring. For example, we think of Iraq and Afghanistan as countries. We're a country. They're a country. <clears throat> Neither one of them is a country. What Iraq is, is six or seven hundred tiny little hegemonies with sheiks and warlords and crime lords and uh, 
commandants and stuff like that, mullahs in the south. It isn't a country, and Afghanistan is even more not a country. And so we think, well, it's important for us to do business with the leadership of the government. Well, there's like 700 governments. There isn't one government. And so why aren't we getting anywhere? Well, we don't get it. I mean, Petraeus gets it, by the way. I like him. He definitely gets it. And uh, he understood with his awakening councils and things like that, that you have to work at the local level. And that was really, in my opinion, what turned around the surge, not the increase of troops. Afghanistan's a different kettle of fish. But I see this all the time, that we see in someone else what we expect in ourselves, And that ain't the case. It really ain't the case in right. Afghanistan and Iraq. Fascinating. Uh, another one of your items in the playbook is um, hitting your target by flying under the radar. Uh, Mavericks in the stealth mode. Uh, you talked about uh, a fellow named Bill McLean, the Sidewinder missile. You may have some other examples, but well, the, my, how do you my do favorite it? is in Telepedia. Right. Um, after 9/11, we were charged to connect the dots to share information. And that was what my job was as the director, associate director of national intelligence. My job was to connect the dots with technology. That's what Congress wanted us to do. That's what the president wanted us to do. It's what the American people wanted us to do. Well, guess what? It wasn't happening. You know, I went to a guy at CIA shortly after joining NSA, and this is in the book. And I said, hey, let's cooperate, let's share. And he goes, Eric, NSA, you know, he said, Al Qaeda is our target, you're our enemy. This is after 9-11, and I can't tell you how many times I sat in a meeting. I guess it'll take another 9-11 before we get our shit together. And someone said, well, wasn't one enough? And the answer is, no, one wasn't enough. And that's a very sad statement. Uh, but so what I found was interesting that happened is after 9-11, we hired a bunch of young kids. And these kids came into the intelligence community with a different set of habits and expectations than us old farts. They were into social media. And what is social media? It's information sharing. It's in their DNA. So what happens is you get some of these kids come in, and they see that the tools they have in the outside world, like <laughs> Facebook and Twitter and Wikipedia, they don't have in the inside. And in fact, we lose a lot of them because they sign up thinking they'll be James Bond and quit when they realize they're Dilbert. <laughs> uh, and so, so these guys said, hey, you know, uh, what we're going to do is create a wiki for intelligence that takes Web 2.0, social media, and creates sharing. But they knew that that was going to be a big problem at CIA. CIA, among all the ones, is very, uh, for good reasons, because it's human intelligence and lives are at stake. Um, you'd, it's really compartmented, and no one shares anything with anyone. And so they realized this was going to be a challenge. So here's what they did. They say, we're going to do a chewable chunk. We're going to sell a big idea by making it look like a small one. So they did something very clever. They went to each office chief at CIA, and they said, tell us your biggest problem. These were some geeks like me, uh, young geeks. Younger, right. Young geeks. And uh, they said, tell us your biggest problem. And every office told them the same thing. We don't know what we know. We collect all this intelligence. All the analysts hoard it. They don't share it. And then they leave, or they get moved off, or whatever. And we don't know what we know. And this is a problem in 9-11, because what did the commission want to know? What did you know, and when did you know it? And they said, we don't know what we knew, and we didn't know when we knew it. <laughs> this was not an acceptable answer. And uh, one of the heads of the analysis group at CIA got an opportunity to pursue a career elsewhere because that happened. Yes. So people under her watch this happen and they go, hmm, I got to know what we know. And I got to know when we knew it. So this is what they heard from every station, every office chief in the Directorate of Intelligence. And so they said, well, what if we could give you something tomorrow, literally, that would cost you nothing, take nothing to operate and maintain, and it would work instantly? They said, wait a minute, cost me nothing. No budget, no, no nothing, it works instantly? He said, yeah, it's called this little thing called a wiki. We have got it certified. We brought it in from Wikipedia. It's sitting here, and all you got to do is dump your documents in there, and then you can find them. They go, hmm, won't cost me anything, work tomorrow, solve my problem, why not? So what they knew, though, was this was going to work with every office chief. So everybody pooled it, and then what happened after about six months? They had it all. It was all there. I mean, when I say all, it isn't all, but it was way more. And they called it, uh, first it was Iraqopedia. And then when it went beyond the Iraq office, they called it Intellipedia. And then it extended beyond CIA. Well, you can imagine, this was all done in hallways and water coolers and bars 
uh, all informal, no office, no budget, no bureaucracy. And I found out about it when these guys, I was the associate director, you know, and they came to me and they said, we want you to know about this. And I said, oh my God, this is the best thing that's happened in the intelligence community since 9-11, and you did it for nothing and you did it in six months. I said, I'm gonna give you a, you know, a few hundred million dollars you know, to make this, they said, no, 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 we don't want any money. And I go, what? And they said, because with money will come bureaucracy and that will kill it. You know, and it turns out that they knew what they were talking about because when it got to be a certain level of success, people at CIA tried to kill it, but they couldn't kill it because there was no there there. There was no budget, there was no staff, there was no authority. <laughs> there was nothing. You couldn't kill it. It was you got the solution for solving Washington. No, it was it was the most amazing example of bureaucratic black beltness. Mm -hmm. You know, they understood how to defeat the bureaucracy by not engaging it. And you know, it really frustrated all these people. They kept trying to kill it. Well, it, it was it was spread everywhere. It was like the internet. You couldn't kill it. It was too late. And uh, so they that was flying under the radar. And uh, uh, I have a friend, Steve Nixon, who succeeded me, and he's been working on what he calls taming wicked problems. It turns out Washington is the center of wicked problems. And a wicked problem is something like health care reform, solving terrorism, global warming, where the technology really isn't the issue. It's hard, but it's not near as hard as the sociology and politics. And in Washington today, almost all of our big problems are wicked problems. And he's talking about how you, how you tame them. And the way you tame them is you start under the radar. You don't engage the bureaucracy. You don't stimulate the antibodies. You know, you get it to a point where it's fait accompli, and then you get, get somebody to take credit for it. Going to write that down. Uh, you talk about trying to convince someone uh, or people to do something new, do something different, uh, achieve this uh, big bang, that uh, Sensory stimulation is very important. It's not just the intellectual persuasion. It's not just coming up with the device that part of the cell and part of the accomplishment comes from sensory. Right. Uh, uh, and you used, uh, well, you used the Buick, as you mentioned, but uh, the iPad was one that right. had that. But anyhow, well, talk uh, my about boss that a little at bit. Disney, a guy named Brand Farron, before I took his place, said to me, in selling an idea, avoid subtlety at all costs. <laughs> And Walt Disney put it different. He said, you can talk to people's hearts or you can talk to their minds, but there are a lot more hearts out there. So if you want to persuade, speak to the heart, right? The mind pretty much isn't there anyhow. So uh, Walt Disney also, when someone asked him how many people work for him, he said, about half. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so those of you who have a workforce will, will relate to that. Um, but uh, the point is this that you get to the heart through the senses. And if you look at the most effective sales pitches, they're sensorially rich. And I give the example in my book of a concept car where instead of showing a drawing of a car, a model of a car, you put someone inside a car. But the best example is at Disney. At Imagineering, where we designed and built the theme parks, we always had to pitch Michael Eisner on our new theme park idea. And you can imagine we had to make the pitches better and better and better. So we wanted to sell them in the city of an animal park. So Joe Rohde, the head guy, says, Michael, you got to show up at your screening room at exactly noon. So pick a day when you can. He did. He sits down alone in the screening room, and he hears from the right. And he looks, and in comes a Bengal tiger, complete with fangs and claws. The Bengal tiger walks around. It was trained. It looks at Michael, sniffs, kind of, am I going to eat him or not? Decides not to, walks out. And Joe Rody comes in and says, Michael, that's the experience we're going to give our guests. <laughs> right? Now that's sensorial richness. Right. And, that, and, that's and it worked. The soul. He bought off on the concept. Right. So don't y'all want to go to Animal right. Kingdom now? Um, I'm going to run out of my time in a moment, and it'll be your time. So I want you have described in your book, I don't know if you still feel that way, um, that the biggest bang in your mind has been uh, basically the European Union. Right. And, uh, and it was a classic example of... Long Fuse Big Long Bang. Long Fuse Big Bang, Bang. thank you. Um, and I found it fascinating because covering the news, it's you know, something that we looked at and we still are as we deal with the Euro and the European Union. So frame that for us, how, why it's such a good example and, and brings together so many of the playbook rules that you've got. Yeah, it basically 
tells the story of an individual. And I'm going to ask the audience, how many of you know who Jean Monnet is? So about a third of you, which is interesting. In my opinion, he may be, when history books are written 10,000 years from now, he'll be up there as one of the great figures in all of human history. And it's because you haven't heard of him that he's great. For example, he was responsible for Lend-Lease. He was responsible for the Arsenal for Democracy. He was responsible ultimately for the European Union and a bunch of other things, the European Common Market. And he said something interesting that showed how he truly deeply understood people. He said, number one, politicians never have any good ideas because they're too busy trying to attack other politicians. So what you have to do is wait for a crisis when that politician's going to need a good idea and give him that idea, provided you can make it look like it's his own. So with the arsenal democracy idea, uh, Roosevelt heard that term, liked it, and sent out word that, don't say that anymore, that's mine now. <laughs> right? And so uh, he had a vision. He started off in 1917 trying to get the British and the French to coordinate their shipping and supply chain for the war. And he had some success with wheat, as it turns out, and shipping. Because, you know, ships were going from England, going to France, coming back empty. And he says, no, 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 that's half the shipping. We've got to make them full both ways. So he, at, barely by the end of the war, he was able to get them to do it. Um, and he had a deep insight about human nature. He said, people only change out of necessity, and they only recognize necessity in crisis. So one of the deep wisdoms he learned was, don't try to change things unless there's a crisis, because it ain't going to work. So, in the middle of World War II, he's now doing more or less the same stuff with the, with the British and the French, trying to, you know, he was the author of, did you know that France and England were at one time during World War II a single nation? Yeah, they were, it, they, you know, de Gaulle and uh, Churchill drafted it and agreed to it, and uh, Pétain, or whoever it was, wouldn't sign it. Uh, but, but there was a, free, a, a moment there where they were going to merge. Can you imagine that? You know? A Ginecourt, you know, all that. No, they, they were going to, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, what, what he did was in 1943, he said, you know what? I've, he started thinking about how do we ever prevent a war in Europe again? And he says, we have to make the economic interests of the party such that it would be stupider to go to war than not. So he has this idea for the economic union in 1943, in the middle of the war. Do you think that was a good time to sell it? I don't think so. I don't think Hitler and uh, de Gaulle and Churchill would have been able to sit down and work out the uh, European Union at that time. So uh, what he does is he waits until 1950, and he gets uh, Acheson to tell the French and the uh, English that, hey, you know, we're going to rearm Germany because we're worried about the Ruskies. Now, we're going to do it, or you're going to do it. It's going to happen. So the French, who, by the way, I didn't know this. It shocked me. They were up to their same crap that they did after Versailles. They were raping the Ruhr and the Sudetenland. All the coal and steel, they were sucking it. They were bleeding Germany dry. It's like they didn't learn the first time. They were doing it again. And the Germans were getting really ticked off about it. But the French didn't care. You know, they had won. And all of a sudden, now they're going to be rearmed. Sacre bleu. Uh, well, he caused this to happen under the hood, right? Because Atchison really liked him. It was going to happen anyhow because the Korean Peninsula was heating up and so forth. So he had ready a plan that he started drafting in 1943 for what he called the uh, coal and steel consortium between Germany and France, where they would pool their coal and steel production as one thing. And that was his goal, so that they would be one economic entity in coal and steel. And uh, he called it the Schumann Plan, who was the uh, foreign minister of France at the time. He didn't call it the Monet Plan. It was the Schumann Plan. Crisis, plan. Two years later, you had the European coal and steel. Now, here was his true genius. What does every bureaucracy anywhere in the world try to do as job number one. Expand. So he had a bunch of transnational bureaucrats. What were they going to try to do? Expand. And expanding, what were they going to do? They were going to create the European Union. And that's what happened. It took 40 years, but it happened exactly like. And John Kennedy said in 1963, shortly before his death, he wrote Jean Monnet a letter. He says, you have done more to unify Europe in 20 years than happened a thousand years before you. Right? And the reason he succeeded as you've never heard of him because he gave someone else credit for it. So this guy really understood human nature, and I think it's the biggest bang. Now, you know, the European Union is going through some rough spots right now, and there are some things, but I think uh, we're going to look back on that as being one of the great transcendent moments in history. Yeah. Certainly a, a great example of overcoming tribalism.
That's right. He didn't overcome tribalism. He just redrew the boundaries. See, the number one premise in my book is you never defeat the brain. It's stronger than you by a lot. You got to finesse it and play judo with it. So your brain is short term, beat it short term. Your brain is tribal, beat it tribal. He just redefined what tribal was. Instead of us being French, it's us being the Germans and the French economically trying to screw the rest of the world, <laughs> right? Which that second part turns out to be very important to human nature, right? It isn't, uh, Oscar Wilde said, it's not so much that we should succeed, but that our friends should fail. Uh, on that note, we'll open it up. <laughs> Lots of questions. We'll start right here. Yeah. Uh, sincere question. Um, what were your mom and dad's uh, uh, brains like? <laughs> Uh, my dad was. Did you a, all hear the question? What were my mom and da dad's brain like? Pretty much damaged after they had the four of us. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, my dad was a rocket scientist, kind of an Aspergerish kind of guy, uh, mathematics, physics. My mom was a French teacher, uh, so she was left brain. He was right. Uh, she was right brain. He was left brain, and we ended up somewhere in the middle. And for the four kids, who were your mentors? Who were the mentors? Well, I, I think that our mentors, our parents didn't allow us to have television, so they made us read stuff like Shakespeare and Sophocles and uh, Descartes and Goethe. And uh, so everyone else was watching Get Smart and uh, Hiram Holiday, and I had to read Shakespeare. So those were our mentors, really. Yeah. Uh, comment on the Sputnik moment and the revolution in education and technology investment that followed it. Well, I love that question. Thank you. And he, it wasn't a plant. But this is my number one concern uh, in the public policy arena is American competitiveness going down the tubes because we are suffering a silent Sputnik. There's a great report out by the National Academy of Science called Is America Falling Off a Flat Earth? And the answer is, yeah. We're not falling off. We've fallen off. And it has to do with China's passing us in patents. China's passing us in uh, referee publications. And if you think about this, where do jobs come from? Growth. Where does growth come from? Innovation. Where does innovation come from? Technology. Where does technology come from? Technologists and scientists, right? So, bottom line, that nation which has the richest science and technology is winning in the job arena. And it ain't going to be about cheap labor, it's going to be about smart labor. And as director uh, of science and technology for the intelligence committee, part of my job was to look at the other guys. And what I saw scared the crap out of me. I mean, I know stuff that I can't talk about, but what I know just really, really bothers me. And so uh, in the last administration, I tried to nudge this a little bit by talking to the president's science advisor. This administration has been a little bit more uh, forward leaning, but we are undergoing a silent Sputnik. And if you look at the first Sputnik, it's a classic example of Jean Monnet's people only change in crisis and uh, in necessity and only recognize necessity in crisis. Sputnik was a crisis. Nukes going over our head. Really clear here and now. The problem with the uh, silent Sputnik, which is China and Japan and Singapore and other people passing us, is that it's the frog boiling in water. It's not a here and now moment. And I applaud the President's State of the Union speech in which he advocated for greater R&D. But if he'd had me on his advising team, I'd say, you don't understand human nature. You've got to make a way of American voters seeing an immediate payoff to increase R&D investment. If you'd said, we're going to put in investment tax credits that's going to increase the PE multiple of the stocks in your retirement fund and portfolio so that you can borrow more money and you can feel richer today, they, I think he would have got a much better response than he'd got because I think it was probably completely ineffective. Because if I'm worrying about my job today, why do I care about investment that won't pay off in 10 years? You know. I ain't going to save my best picture for the eighth game of the World Series. I got to survive today, dude. But it is about survival today. American companies' PE multiples would go up if they could convince the street that they have a bigger future. They could take that future investment and put it into higher stock price today. See, that's the way the president ought to be thinking. But he doesn't listen to me. We'll have to send him the book. Yeah, send him the book, yes. Um, hi, uh, Garrett Mitchell. Um, I, I was just sitting here thinking that um, I, um, I understand what the Big Bang means, 
and I understand what the long fuse means, I think, in, in brief. What, what I'm not clear about is uh, the sort of so what part of both of those components, which is to say, uh, so n we know about the Big Bang and we know about the long fuse, so what? What, what is, it's a great what, question. What is this book, yeah, where so are we going with this? Now, each of you probably has to do something like a five-year plan. Uh, or something that looks at more than just one year down the road. Or you at least have to plan for next year. So you're developing a new offering, a new service, a new product, a new solution of some kind. Um, you've got to do that anyhow. And so you're going to spend time doing that. What this book teaches you is not changing what you do, but subtly changing how you do it to get a much bigger result in the near term and in the long term. So I'll give you an example. Let's go back to this opera company. Right? I think the Big Bang is they can deliver video anytime, anywhere, free at super high definition. That's a Big Bang for them. That's going to grow their brand equity like you wouldn't believe. It's going to take a long time, though. Um, so by saying, we've got to start doing some new projects anyhow, let's pick one that's going to move us in a strategic direction. And the way I uh, analogize it, does any of you play eight ball or pool? Well, the way it works is you have a bunch of pool balls, you have a cue ball, and you have a bunch of other balls. And you have to sink is solid and stripe. So if you're solids, you have to sink all the solids before the other guy sinks the stripes. And I had a pool table in the fraternity I was in in college. And I was a pretty good shot, but I always lost. And I started thinking, why am I always losing? So I watched the other guys, and I realized that the reason I lost is that I just tried to sink the ball. I didn't think about where I left the cue ball so that I could get the next shot and the next shot and the next shot. So the so what is that in your planning of your future, Play like a good pool player. Plan out every shot so that when you finish the first shot, you've left somewhere where you have a future versus no future. You follow me? Yeah. In the back? Oh, halfway in the back. Yes. Hi, Barbara Buchanan. Um, I think from a neuroscience standpoint, and I'm not a neuroscientist, and I, I don't play one on television either. Um, aren't you, what I think I hear you saying is calm their limbic system. In the CIA, you're saying, you know, the, as the project was brought into the intelligence community, if somebody had said, gee, we're going to do this really big thing and everybody's going to share and it's going to cross uh, agency lines, people would freak from a standpoint of fear. <laughs> it's going to get out. It's going to leak. Um, you know, we can't control it anymore. And so the approach they took never activated um, a fear center of the brain. So what I think you're saying is what your consulting does is to get everybody out of their fear center and into the prefrontal cortex. So it, to the extent that somebody's saying, no, my, you know, I have a board of directors that's going to expect quarterly results, and you're telling me not to worry about the quarterly results, you're showing them how to, how to calm down and get the anxiety reduced and get into the thinking part of the brain, which I think is, the, to me, the aha. Well, I would say you're half right. Okay. You're half right, and you have to avoid fear. But it's kind of like the skilla and the charybdis, or however you pronounce, you know, the sirens and the circes and all that stuff, you know, and Ulysses. You got to navigate between two extremes, right? So you definitely are absolutely right. You have to calm down the fear part. But we don't make decisions in our cortex. <coughs> Consciousness and logic are pretty much irrelevant to our lives. And that's a whole separate book, you know. But the fact is that you don't make decisions based on logic and frontal cortex. You make them in your heart, which is limbic system. So what I would say, the other half is, feed the limbic system. Feed greed. Got to have it now. Want it now. Right? So uh, go back to the example of these office chiefs at CIA. They were thinking, oh, I've got a solution to my problem right now. I can, look good. I can get promoted. Right? So they fed greed and avoided fear. So the first part's very true. But you don't, again, you speak to people's hearts, not their minds. And uh, there's a great book out by Goldman who wrote the emotional intelligence. He calls it primal leadership. And he said resonance in a leader is you persuade with passion, not with logic. I, I connected with that a little better. Another aspect of that you talk about in your book, uh, thinking inside the box. So this yes. is different than fear, but you're talking about rewarding. Well, that, that's things. a whole separate thing in the brain's playbook. Right. Here's a real simple principle. No, a very complex principle of brain science. You get behavior reward and don't get behavior you punish. 
And you know, it's astonishing how many organizations don't adhere to that simple. And there's just a little box. There's good behavior and bad behavior. There's reward and punishment. And you want to reward good behavior and avoid rewarding bad behavior. You want to punish bad behavior and avoid punishing good behavior. Right? And most people only think about rewarding good behavior. They don't think about avoiding punishing good behavior or avoid rewarding bad behavior. So what happens? New CEO comes in and says, we are risk oriented. We are going to go out there and kick butt. And I want to see projects. And someone takes a risk. They succeed. They get promoted. They get all kinds of recognition. Someone takes a risk and fails. They're fired. Or you take a careful executive who is an adverse risk and they promote them. They're rewarding bad behavior. This is what happens in organizations. And so when I say stay inside the box, you have to pay attention to all the risk of reward of all good and bad behavior. But that's a separate playbook thing. Right. Yes, in the back. Fantastic. It's a great talk. Um, so I, one fifth of our economy, it seems, almost is going to be healthcare, right? 17%. Oh, it's more than that. Yeah, it's going to be jumping up. So quick question. How do you take some of the principles you've advocated in your book how can we apply that to the challenge of healthcare in the United States? Well, here's an example. Again, if I had been advising Obama, I personally like healthcare reform, and I'll tell you why. Um, if you look at an automobile, which we still make in America for the moment, <laughs> the number one factor of cost isn't the steel, isn't the labor, it's healthcare. So, do you think our healthcare costs have something to do with competitiveness? And do you think something about competitiveness has something to do with jobs? Uh, yeah! So, if I had been Obama, I would have made healthcare a jobs issue because it is. It's not baloney, it is. And somehow, how he missed that? I don't know. But it's like, duh! So, there would be an example. People, jobs is a here and now issue. And I think you could explain to people. You could take a car and show, do a little. Ross Perot pie chart thing and show 60% of it is healthcare costs. And they go, whoa! I don't know if it's 60%, but it's big. And it's growing, right? So, uh, you know, that's an example. It, whatever it is you do, you have to make it pay off instantly, right? That's, I mean, that's my answer to everything. You don't fight the brain, you don't actually cater to the long term part because there really isn't one. Uh, we only live in an eternal now. When you think about it, tomorrow doesn't exist. Yesterday's gone. This is sounding like a Chris Christopherson song. But. <laughs> Other questions? Another question? Yeah. Nobody else. Helps. Uh, this is this is. Uh, I, I don't think this is a Big Bang Long Fuse, but it's about one of your uh, former employers. About 15 years ago, I met your predecessor, Brand Farron. And uh, we talked at, at the end of this meeting, and I was trying to get him to explain what he did before when, when Eisner hired him. And, and he said, and, and I wasn't having much luck understanding, and he said, that's okay, neither did Eisner. He said he had no idea what he was buying. What he wanted to be sure was that nobody else got it. So leaping from that to um, uh, a, a a guy who made a lot of intelligent decisions. What, what, uh, what did, did you make or do you make of the Eisner Ovitz, Eisner's decision to hire Ovitz and why that went up in flames so quickly? Well, I knew both of them very well. And I don't think there's anything I could say that wouldn't get both of them pissed at me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to try to BS you and give you some baloney answer. I'm not going to answer that question because <laughs> the truth is ugly. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I infer from your comments on Europe and on uh, crisis that the best thing that can possibly happen to move the European Union along in its development toward a United States of Europe is to uh, is for the uh, the Greek and um, and Portuguese and Irish crises to be replicated in a few more countries so that they have to start issuing uh, total Europe debt the way the United States I issues total U.S. debt. I don't know the pigs problem you're talking about. I don't know. Uh, my gut says no. I think something like Russia deciding to cut off oil and gas would be an example. Common threat. Uh, alien invasion. 
I mean, you laugh. You know, Ronald Reagan, when he was doing the START Treaty, says to Gorbachev or whoever it was he was dealing with, he says, you know, wouldn't it be easier if uh, it was us against the aliens? You know, and people laughed at that, but he's actually right. If you say, what is it going to take to unite all of humans? That's what it's going to take. You know, you have to define yourself in terms of what you're not. You've got to be mad at somebody. It's our tribal genes. So Europe will only be cohesive as Europe when there's an anti-Europe they have to unite against. Are we it? Yeah. <laughs> Japan, you know, China. China's a good one. Iran has helped a little bit because, you know, their missiles can hit Europe. Yeah. Yes, you. So when you unite against a common enemy, uh, how do you unite a group uh, when it's a successful group and you're trying to sus sustain success? How do you unite that group? Constant crisis. <laughs> you know, what happens is success carries with it the seeds of its own senescence and destruction. Look at the history of great civilizations. To my knowledge, there's only one big inst human institution that's ever succeeded long, and that, strangely enough, is the Catholic Church. 2,000 years old, going strong, in no danger. It's got some problems, right? It's got problems, but it's still going. So there's something about that that's really interesting, and, and I don't understand it. But every other human institution that's big has gone down the tubes. Why? Same thing happens. Uh, and I've seen this in the life cycle of companies. I've been part of some of them. You know, I was part of huge aircraft in the go-go years, and then we crashed and burned. We got bought out. We're no longer a company, right? And I've seen it happen over and over again that, uh, and Clayton Christensen talks about this in Innovator's Dilemma, that, you know, you become a victim of your own success. You tend to focus on that which you expect and want. You don't think outside the box. The world changes, passes you by, and you become irrelevant. Did you know that how many of the original Fortune 500 companies in 1955 are still with us? Out of 500, what percent? 14 percent. Half of the companies that were in the Fortune 500 10 years ago are gone, not in the Fortune 500, right? You not only have to run as fast as you can to stay in the same place, you've got to run faster. The world changes at an accelerating rate. And so uh, my guess is that if the U European Union is going to survive, they're going to have to be really challenged and constantly because the forces of fission are always stronger than the forces of fusion. Thanks. Uh, I, I think there's so many insights in what you have to say. It's, uh, it's hard to know how to formulate any one question without uh, wandering off. I'll wander off a little bit, and then I'll try to come back to a key point. Uh, I haven't read your chapter on Gerstner and so forth, but there's an interesting case where, uh, you know, uh, IBM. Lou Gerstner of IBM. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's, IBM is about to go off the cliff, so he changes the company entirely and has to go do something else and, and, and keeps the brand. and. And uh, you know it's what it's 25 percent of computers now, and the rest of it services. Uh, so, uh, but that that's a little bit relevant to uh, my main question. You've you've talked a lot about public policy and getting public organizations to do things, whether it's the intelligence community or uh, uh, or our R and D policy or a lot of things like that. And isn't isn't a, a part of the problem here, which I'm not sure your 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 uh, uh, your prescription fixes is that the short-term interests and desires of the various political constituencies don't line up. And so uh, you can't just substitute short for long because somehow or another you have to find some compromise uh, between these uh, constituencies. Uh, and at least they, they may actually be closer together if they had analyzed it better, but in their brain uh, they think their short-term uh, desires are X, and they think their big bang long-term wishes are Y, and those are very strongly held beliefs, and those things don't line up amongst groups and so forth. And uh, therefore, we have a lot of people who don't believe in Keynesian economics and don't believe in global warming and don't believe in stuff that is kind of the background uh, within which this uh, effort to try to make things right. short-term has to work. Uh, and uh, so... No, I got it. And so he, let me say this. First of all, there is no human problem that my book doesn't fix. <laughs> right. So uh, I want to I be very clear on that point. 
uh, but let me take your specific point. Uh, clear and modest. Yes. Yeah, I'd be perfect if I weren't so modest. Right? Uh, the, so, That's a short-term approach. Exactly. No, but, but to be, no books. In, all in all seriousness, folks, um, let's take the example. Uh, in my book, I talk about human diversity. And within, take the Republican and Democratic Party, even the Tea Party, right? You know, take polar opposites, if you will. Um, what you're going to find, because of diversity, is not everybody's the same. You're going to find that there are people in both parties who actually have common ground with each other. Maybe even though one's a Republican, one's a Democrat, they're buddies on Facebook or something like that. In other words, there's a rebel alliance, there's an underground, there's a maquis. It exists. I guarantee you there are people in the RNC or active in the Republican Party and people in the Democratic Party who are talking to each other and doing things under the radar because they believe in it. Maybe they went to college together. Maybe they're in a social network together. Whatever. It happens. It happens even in the Cold War. You would be astonished at how many American spies and Russian spies would get together for vodka and, you know, share perspectives when they weren't supposed to. And thank God. And thank God. So what happens is, essentially, there's a great book, you know, uh, The Joy Luck Club, where Amy Tan talks about this Chinese word that means the better half of mixed intentions. It's a very subtle term. But humans have a better half and a lot of good half. And so within all human organizations, you have extremism, you have turf, you have ego, you have instant gratification. But at the same time, you have cooperative instincts. We are, after all, a social species that survive and thrive by cooperating with each other. That's what language is about. That's what tribalism is about. It's a good thing, up to a point. So my point is this, that in any diverging society, you're going to have people who do not diverge, but that converge, but they're going to do it under the radar because the dominant themes are conflict. You define yourself as a party as what you're not. Rush Limbaugh spends all his time trashing liberals, right? He defines himself by what he's not. But there are people under the hood who aren't doing that. And so here's the thing. There is disease, and I think the conflict is disease, and there's health, which is cooperation. So as a leader, you can come in and say, am I going to try to cure disease or nurture health. So to get to your point, what I would say is find out where these rebels are cooperating with each other under the radar and try to help them under the radar. Take obstacles out of their way. What I did with these guys from Intellipedia when they said don't give me money, I, what I decided to do was let it be known that I really like this and if someone wanted to take them on, they had to take me on. And so I was kind of the big gorilla that people didn't want to take on. And so I just kept the antibodies away or ran air cover or whatever you want. In other words, I nurtured health. I did not try to cure disease. You never win curing disease. Never. You know, you're not going to change human nature. You're not going to change tribalism. You're not going to change buttheadedness. There will always be a Jerry Springer, you know. Uh, it's just always a fact of life. But you also are not going to stop people from doing healthy cooperative things. It's always going to be there. If you find it, it'll be there. And I can't tell you how many times I give speeches where I ask people, how many of you are boss, and maybe a third raise their hand, and I say, the two-thirds of you, how many of you are doing stuff that you knew, if your boss knew, you would be fired for, but that it's the right stuff? And you can kind of go, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that would be my answer. I think that's a uh, perfect note to uh, <laughs> conclude on, uh, to look toward the future. Thank you very much Thank for you. a fabulous hour. Thanks. Terrific. <laughs>